Henderson. <laughs> um, I'm happy to see you guys. We're going to do a short Q&A, and then we'll actually take a few questions from the audience during that, and then we're going to do a reading for you. So it's going to be a lot of fun. So um, great to be here with you. And um, I understand you're here to promote Shadows of Self. I am. All right, so what I'd like to do, I'm, re I'm really fascinated with the, the whole idea of the Cosmere, but uh, what I'd like to do instead is just kind of ease into the Mistborn series, uh, give people who may not be familiar with that a taste, and then um, move on to the Alloy of Law and then uh, Shadows of Self, just to, okay. to yeah. talk about that a transition mm -hmm. a little bit. So I originally pitched the Mistborn series um, as a sequence of trilogies. Um, a lot of epic fantasy has this, uh, this aspect to it. It's not a bad thing. It's not necessarily a good thing. It's a lot of the worlds don't change. They'll last for thousands of years um, without a lot of technological development or anything like that, which leads to some very fun storytelling. It's how it was in Tolkien and a lot of, a lot of the great epic fantasies. But I, I noticed this and I thought it was a trend. And I'm like, can I evolve one of these? Can I write a story where I've got an epic fantasy trilogy? Um, and then later, a modern day trilogy where the epic fantasy, you know, all the things that happen, the world building, the, myth, um, the, the magic and the events become the source of history and mythology in a contemporary setting. That was really exciting to me. And then I wanted to take it and do a science fiction setting where we are transitioning into the future with this magic running through as a thread becoming the means by which space travel is possible. Um, and so it's this, this continuum, this set of, uh, of series where we get to watch the world evolve and progress and become different yet see the references to the old series in, in hopefully very interesting in new ways. So, and this was interesting to me to read a little bit about how the alloy of law came about and, and that was sort of planned, maybe a little bit it, unplanned. It was, see, the, the, the idea was, um, I'm writing the Stormlight Archive, which is big, thick, awesome epic fantasy books. They're just enormous. Um, and they, they have all the great things that you love from a big epic fantasy book. Lots of viewpoints, a um, lot of very complex narrative. Um, but I didn't want people to forget about Mistborn while I was doing this. And I thought, I need something to balance the Stormlight Archive. I need a set of shorter books, um, hopefully still very awesome and incredible, but more intimate. Uh, focused on a couple of characters as a balancing factor so that we have these sort of fast-paced books mixing with, um, alternating with these very big, thick, a little bit more slowly paced books. And um, Alloy of Law was conceived as a way to dip back in to the Mistborn world, to enjoy um, everything we love about that, but also be able to kind of have something snappy, fast-paced, focused on some good dialogue and a, and a twisty plot and then pow, an ending. Um, as opposed to something that you're, you're digging into very deeply. All right. And uh, you talked a little bit about um, how Alloy of Law sort of um, proved to you and, and even your readers that, that this was like kind of a good way to go. Um, wh what, right. was, what was it about Alloy of Law that struck you? What did you really like about it that made you want to then take, uh, go into the Shadows of Self trilogy? It, it was really a, a mix of a couple of things. The, the first one was the way the characters interacted. Um, I had a blast with these characters. Uh, like I said, that, that, that banter, that back and forth, um, that zippy dialogue uh, was something I was really looking for. In fact, I started uh, writing the very first thing I wrote for Alloy Law was about a character named Wayne. Um, he, he's, he's a goofball. He's crazy. He's, um, he's a blast to, to write and to read. Um, but as I was writing this story about him, it, it wasn't working um, because he didn't have a foil. He didn't have someone to play off of. He didn't have a straight man. Um, and that's where I started to expand the story and look at other places I could go. Um, and when I, when I hit on um, Wax, the, the, the other main character, and, and their interaction <laughs> together. Yeah, yeah, Wax and Wayne. <laughs> it is a pun. Um, when, I, when I hit on that, um, it, it, their interaction was so rich and interesting that I, I knew I had something. Um, the other thing that's really working in these books it are the sort of that evolution of the world. Um, people read it and say, wow, I, I love that the goofy street dialect from the original trilogy is now referenced as high imperial, this, you know, grand Latinate sort of language um, because, you know, the character who used to speak that came in and helped found the new society and so it was regarded as something up, upper class. Um, and you see all these fun little threads weaving through them um, that is a lot of fun for me as a writer to, to do these callbacks and things like that. That's great. Um, you, we, we were at GlanceFest a couple days ago, and you talked a little bit about uh, magic systems and kind of in relation to the particular time frame that you picked, right. uh, which is modeled kind of loosely after the late 1800s, early 1900s. Yes. 
Talk a little bit about what you like about that time frame and, and how you borrowed it for the Shadows of Self and LFR. Right. This is my favorite time period in history is that transitionary period between the 1800s and the 1900s. Um, it's this era where science was becoming an, uh, an everyday thing uh, for most people. You know, in eras before, science was something that the guys in far off towers did, right? They thought about things, they wrote about things, but it didn't really impact your life in the same way that this time where you're watching your, your, your lights be replaced by electric lights, where you know, you're, you're used to walking down the street and, and seeing it full of horses, and suddenly it's these you know, metal carriages with, that are driving around and making noise, and your, your entire life is changing. Um, it seems like things are getting yanked out from underneath you in a, in a way that just hadn't happened in history before. There had been technological progress, but it, it didn't have that everyday um, impact on people's lives like it was having then. And that made science a very interesting, fascinating thing for a lot of people. It was, it, it was, it was impacting them in very different ways. And I, I love this period and mixing in the idea that the magic is the familiar thing and the technology is the new thing, the newfangled thing, the, the weird, wondrous thing is really cool to me um, because it's, it's, you know, it's a different thing for our world where we would imagine magic being this mystical thing. And it's, it's weird because in my books, I rarely use the word magic uh, because I'm, I'm working with basically new branches of physics, right? To them, it's normal. This is how the world is. It's, um, it's an aspect of the world. Uh, it's, it's not something mystical. It's something every day. Uh, and to have the science be the mystical thing is really cool. So t tell me a little bit about how things changed or evolved from the Mistborn series to this newer series with more technology that's coming in. Right. Um, so what I, what I was digging into with this is uh, uh, there are some things that I wanted to keep the same. Uh, and the core of what made me enjoy the original Mistborn series is they're, they're city books. They're books about being in these large cities and dealing with the, the politics and the, um, the atmosphere of these cities. And I wanted to keep that. That was, that was the core. But the city now is, a, is an industrialized city. Um, it's a city where they're building skyscrapers and racing to see who can build the tallest one, which is something they did in New York all the time is, you know, we've got the tallest skyscraper <laughs> and then someone else would no, like build do. theirs. <laughs> uh, there's this great story where they were building buildings and two were trying to see who would be the tallest and one kept back they're like the, the monument they were going to put on the top and put a fake top on their building. So the others finished theirs and then they put their top on and said, right. ah, <laughs> we're taller than you are. Um, and all of these things, I want I to have this cool city dynamic uh, of a city evolving. And that I kept. Um, the other big thing about the Mistborn books were they were a team dynamic. The whole concept for myself originally was I want to tell a, a kind of heist story. Um, and I, I like that team dynamic. And so I wanted to evolve the, the series where each character had a little less access to the magical powers that we've been dealing with, but really focused in on how those powers worked, which, again, was about that whole intimate um, presentation. Rather than going quite as big and vast and epic, we're fo focusing on a couple of characters and a few things that they can do and see them do them really well. Okay, so um, let me pull the, the camera back a little bit. Um, so you have the Stormlight Archive uh, th that's going as well in, in, in combination with this, yeah. uh, which is long, as you said, epic. Um, uh, has, it, it requires a lot of mental energy to, to keep up with it, as, as you said. Talk a little bit about uh, the writing of this kind of story that's more, more streamlined, more focused. Uh, right. and compare and contrast with, with the big Stormlight Archive Well, one books. of the things you want to do when writing a book like this, I'm pacing it a little more like a thriller. Um, and, and some of my favorite thrillers. Michael Crichton probably was my favorite thriller writer. Um, and the idea for these is you want, um, you want to have a streamlined narrative. You want the, what the characters we're talking about to be just as complex as anything else, but we want to deal with having two or three um, and digging into their lives rather than uh, an enormous cast like we do in a big epic fantasy. We want to keep those people generally in the same place, pointed in the same direction. Um, and we, we, instead of crossing months or weeks, it's usually going to be one day, some really dramatic event happening that, uh, with a countdown or a clock or something like this that we've got, we've got trouble we need to deal with. And it, it kind of frays the, um, their, um, their ability to keep up with this, right? It's this, this whole idea of, you know, we've got 12 hours or something terrible happens, and by the end, you, they're just worn down. Um, and, and hopefully the reader is reading this all in one sitting. That's a very big difference. The epic fantasies, you're not going to read in one sitting. You know, you know the 400,000 words or 1,000 pages. Uh, you're going you're gonna to take time in between scenes and sections to digest that book, where this one, you might just pick it up and read it straight through one or two sittings. Yeah. 
So you've talked uh, about how you pitched Mistborn as a, yeah. a series of trilogies. Right. And um, I, th I think you had sort of a, a vision early on of what that might look like. And the new Shadows of Self trilogy was, was not envisioned back at that point? It wasn't that envisioned true? back at that point. So um, how many did you have planned, or do you have planned I at this point? I had three originally. Now okay. we're to four. Um, I really felt like I needed this interim step to tell the story I wanted to tell. Okay. Um, and so we're, the other two are staying roughly the same. I've had to tweak my outlines for things that I've done with this. I'm pulling some things down to this era and pushing other things, you know, forward to another era and things like that. Right. Okay. So um, you talked uh, a little bit about wanting to show the, the passage of time. Uh, yeah. It's one of the reasons that you did this, is to show where things came from and where they head to eventually with maybe a space opera that's yes. uh, towards the tail end. Uh, you also said that you wanted the reader to feel the weight of that passage, the passage right. of time. Um, so what was, in, what was important for you to make the reader feel? How, I mean, how, how did you make them feel the passage of time? And, uh, well, the idea is that I'm the, all of my epic fantasies are connected in this universe, the Cosmere that you mentioned earlier. And the idea is that you know, I'm going to be telling a story that's going to encompass five, 6,000 years, maybe more. Um, yet, a lot of books like that, you have characters that are running through the whole thing. And if you focus on these immortal characters, then it doesn't feel like time is passing. You, you're, you're at the same people. Um, and so the idea of different ages in Mistborn was to change character sets, which is a, a dangerous thing in publishing. People get very attached to a group of characters um, and saying, all right, we're done with these people now. Now read about these people. It's always going to have, um, you know, it, has, it refreshes the series and makes it more lively. But at the same time, there's some readers who are like, yeah, but I love these characters. And I, I can't really approach Mistborn the same way without these characters that I love. Um, I've done that with them from the first book, though. Uh, the very first book, there are certain characters that, that don't transition to the rest of that original trilogy and things like this. And so I've tried to keep people understanding that this is going to be a series that evolves, that there's going to be new characters you love, and some are going to run through and pop up later and things like this. But it's, it's going to be a, a very large cast, but in little chunks. Okay. And you've talked about your, your publisher was a bit nervous about this approach. Yes. Were you nervous about it? Um, yes and no. I mean, I, I write the story that I feel needs to be told. Um, and then I look at it and say, okay, what are the ramifications of this? And I do like to think about that. Um, but at the end of the day, um, you know, you got to write the story you want. Uh, you've got to tell the piece of art. And that makes it authentic, right? Um, if, if you're always trying to second guess what's going to happen with the market, then you don't end up creating something, I think, that actually has some lasting weight and import to it. Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's open it up to some questions at yeah. this point. Right over here. Hello. Hey. hey. Hi. Um, I was just, it's really weird using this. Um, so I look on your website and you have a certain way of organizing the way you work. How does that work like in practice? Like the website is a graphical demonstration of it, but how do you monitor your work? How do you actually function every day? How do you treat it as a job if you do? Well, I do. I'm a very, um, I'm, I'm the type of writer that just needs to be working every day, little by little. I don't, I'm not a binge writer, in other words. A lot of writers are. They'll sit down and be like, I'm going to write this book. They write it in like three or four months, and then they just collapse. Um, I write a bit a, each day, and that's very important to me. It's very important for my mental health that I get some writing done. Um, and I sit down, I, I go to work at about noon, because I didn't become a writer to get up early in the morning. So I get up about noon. Yeah. Um, and then I, I write till about 5, and then I'll spend time with my family, 5.30 to 8.30 or 9. Um, and then when they go to bed, um, I go back to work, and I work from maybe 9 or 10 until 2, 3, 4, somewhere around there, uh, depending on what the deadlines are and things like this. So I get two writing chunks, and that actually works better than one long writing chunk I found. You get yourself refreshed. Um, and it let things stew in your head a little bit, and you come back, and some of the problems that you were working on seem trivial once you get back to it. Any others? Uh, see a hand back there. Um, it's a bit of a two-hander. Was there any particular inspiration for Calcia? And um, I think that Prof and Calcia are like the same sort of character type. Um, they're both charismatic, and <clears throat> one of the ways you do that is by you know, having other characters recognize them as charismatic, yet they feel very different. So I want to know how you um, went about differentiating two characters who fit into the same mold. It's an excellent question, an excellent set of them. Um, Kelsier is very hard for me to pick out where 
his inspiration came from. As a writer, I tend to do a lot of planning up front for a lot of aspects of my books. Uh, my plots, I plot out, I actually plot them backward. I uh, build an outline starting with what I want to have happen in the books and working backward. And my, my world building, I do very extensively. But uh, my characters, I don't plan out very much. Uh, part of this is that I feel that if you plan your characters too much, they, they come out very wooden. Um, and so I'll come up with this setting and then come up with this plot and then I'll start casting people in roles. I'll start writing a story about them. Um, and I'll usually throw these things away. These will just be like, you know, sometimes you see for films, they'll do these test roles with a, with a different actor and then try an, another actor in the same role and things like that. I'm doing that with a personality. Um, and Kelsier, I nailed on the first try. Then took me three tries. But Kelsier, it was that moment in the first book where everyone else is slaving away and working. They're, they're enslaved, they're, they're working the fields, they're you know, toiling, and he is out there and looks up and grins with that sort of sarcastic, cocky grin, um, and that's what made Kelsier. Kelsier is the cocky one. Uh, really differentiating him uh, from Prof was not too hard because Prof is, at his soul, a humble man. He was a, he was a school teacher. He, was, um, he enjoyed his teaching, but you know, he's, he's a man forced into what he's doing. Kelsier thrives on conflict. He thrives on being in the limelight and in front of everybody else. Um, and Kelsier, because of that, has this really dark edge to him. And that's a part of what really defines Kelsier. Kelsier's the guy that in another book could have been the villain. Um, but in this book, in this time, with this, these challenges, he becomes the hero. Uh, and that edge was so uh, fulfilling and satisfying to write. This guy that you know could have been on the other side um, in the wrong position made him so fascinating. He, he was this guy rocking on this line of, of danger, and uh, it, it, it made for a great character. Do you ever find that you, um, that you thought you knew a character and they totally threw you for a loop kind of partway through the book you and know, they turned out to be different? That doesn't happen a lot to me. Yeah. Um, that happens a lot to, to writers I find that Discovery write more than I do. Um, me, if I'm trying out a character and they not, aren't who you know, I need for that role, I'll set them aside and say, I'll do that character for another book. Or if I try them out and they're brilliant, but the, the, the plot doesn't work for them, I'll rebuild my plot. Um, to match what, they, what this new character that I'm so interested in is going to be. Um, and so that rarely surprises me. It's all this experimenting and seeing what's going to work. Okay, great. Any more questions? Yeah, we probably have time for one, one more, I would guess. Yeah. Um, if part of the final Mistborn trilogy is going to involve sci-fi and space travel, uh, could characters from Scadrial end up going to other, char uh, other worlds in the Cosmere? And if so, what would then happen to their magical abilities? Well, um, for the second question, you're going to have to find out because that is the <laughs> main point um, of doing this is to have it so that I can write these books that eventually are going to these worlds are going to converge. Now, for right now, this is all Easter eggs. Uh, you don't have to worry about right now um, having re reading the books in a particular order. You don't have to have read Mistborn to enjoy Stormlight Archive, but eventually these things are going to ram together. And when that happens, um, all bets are off. Um, so I do think we should go to the reading yeah. um, right now, if I can figure out how to turn on the iPad here. Um, so I'm going to read to you. It's actually a little bit of a longer reading. It's about 20 minutes, um, but uh, it's a special treat. I'm going to be reading from the third Stormlight Archive book, which is not out yet. Um, we are planning to release that perhaps next fall. Um, and so it should be very fun. Um, I feel... I feel very bad for my sign language interpreter here because I'm going to have lots of weird words <laughs> for you. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so this is, and this actually isn't a spoiler if you haven't read the Stormlight Archive books because it's about a character we're having a flashback. Um, each Stormlight Archive book has a character that we flash back to a previous part of their lives. This is taking place 30 years before the first book. Now, um, this character's life is very different back then, so perhaps when you get to uh, the book in the future, you will, uh, or if you ever read the, um, the Stormlight Archive books, you're like, wow, he's changed. Yes, he has. So here we are. This is uh, about Dalinar um, as a young man. Rock buds crunched like skulls beneath Dalinar's boots as he charged across the burning field. His elites tromped behind him, a hand-picked force of soldiers both light-eyed and dark. They weren't an honor guard. Dalinar didn't need guards. These were simply the men he considered competent enough not to embarrass him. Around him, rock buds smoldered. Moss dried from the summer heat and long days between storms this time of year. 
flared up in waves, setting the rock bud shells themselves aflame. Delnar charged through the smoke, trusting in his padded armor and thick boots to protect him. Flame spread, like tiny people made of fire, danced from one patch of fi fire to the next. The enemy, pressed by his armies from the north, had pulled back into this town just ahead. Dalinar had held himself back with difficulty from entering that initial clash. He'd known the real fighting would take place here, in the town. He hadn't expected the enemy to, in a desperate move, fire this plane, burning their own crops to block the southern approach. Well, no matter. The, the fires could go to damnation for all Dalinar cared. He led his men in a charge, and though some were overwhelmed by the smoke or heat, most stayed with him. They would crash into the enemy from the south, pressing them between his elites and the main army, Hammer and Anvil, the best kind of tactic, the kind that didn't allow his enemies to get away from him. As Dalinar burst from the smoky air, he found a few lines of spearmen hast hastily making ranks on the southern edge of the town. There were remnants of a wall, but the enemy he fought had torn that down years back. Dalinar had forgotten the town's name, but the location was ideal. A large ridge to the east made a natural break from the storms and had allowed this place to sprawl almost like a real city. Dalinar screamed at the enemy soldiers, beating his sword, uh, just a regular longsword, against his shield. He wore a sturdy breastplate and helm along with iron-lined boots. The spearmen ahead of him wavered as his elites roared from the smoke and flame, shouting a bloodthirsty cacophony. A few of the spearmen dropped weapons and ran. Fear spread like globs of violet goo, wriggled up in mass around the enemy rank. Dalinar grinned. He didn't need shards to intimidate. He hit the swordsman like a boulder rolling through a grove of saplings, swinging his sword and sending limbs into the air. A good fight was about momentum. Don't stop, don't think. Drive forward and convince your enemies that they were as good as dead already. That way they'd fight you less as you sent them to their pyres. As he waited among them, the spearmen thrust their weapons frantically, less trying to kill him and more trying to push away this madman. Their ranks collapsed and many of them turned their sides toward Dalinar's elites. Dalinar laughed, slamming aside a pair of spears with his shield and disemboweling one man Man's allies backed away at the horrific sight, so Dalinar came in swinging, catching the two off balance and killing them with a sword that bore their friend's blood. Dalinar's elites decimated the now broken line and the real slaughter began. Dalinar himself pushed forward, keeping momentum, shearing through the ranks until he reached the back, breathing deeply and wiping ashen sweat from his face. A young spearman fell before him, crying, screaming for his mother as he crawled across the stony ground, trailing blood. Fear spread, mixed with pain spread all around. Dalinar shook his head, picking up a fallen spear and striding past the youth, slamming it down into the boy's heart as he passed. Men often cried for their parents as they died. Didn't matter how old they were. He'd seen graybeards do it, same as kids like this one. He's not much younger than I, Dalinar thought. Maybe 17. But then Dalinar had never felt young, regardless of his age. His elites filled in behind him, having carved the enemy line in two. Dalinar danced, shaking off his bloodied blade, feeling alert, excited, but not yet alive. Where was it? Come on, he thought. A larger group of soldiers hiked down the street toward him, led by some officers in white and red. Dalinar could see from the way they pulled up, alarmed, that they hadn't expected their spearmen to fall so quickly. Dalinar charged. His elites knew to watch, so he was fo followed by a force of 50 or 60. The rest had to finish off the unfortunate spearmen. Fifty would do. The crowded confines of the town would mean Dalinar shouldn't need more. As he neared this newer force, he focused his attention on the one man riding a horse. The fellow wore plate armor obviously meant to recreate shard plate, though this was only of common steel. It lacked the beauty, the power of true plate. He still looked like he was the most important person around. Hopefully, that would mean he was the best. The man's honor guard rushed to engage, and Dalinar felt something stir inside of him, like a thirst, a physical need. Challenge. He needed a challenge, Stormit. Well, he let his elites handle the honor guard. The way for him was open to the Bright Lord. Not old enough to be the High Prince, some other important light eyes? Or didn't Dalinar remember something about a son during Gavilar's endless planning meetings? 
Well, this man certainly looked grand on that white mare, watching the battle behind a helmed face, cape streaming bef- behind him. Dalinar pulled up, swiping his sword eagerly, breathing in and out. The foe raised his own sword to his helm and a sign of challenge accepted. Idiot. Dalinar raised his shield arm and pointed, counting on at least one of his strikers to have lived and stayed with him. Indeed, Jenin stepped up, unhooked the short bow from his back, and, as the Bright Lord shouted his surprise, shot the horse in the chest. Hate shooting horses, Jenin grumbled as the beast reared in pain. Like throwing a thousand bromes into the storming ocean, Bright Lord. I'll buy you two when we finish this, Dalinar said as the Bright Lord fell backward, tumbling off his horse. Dalinar dodged around flashing hooves and snorts of pain, seeking out the fallen man. He was pleased to find the enemy rising. Dalinar came in swinging, and the Bright Lord managed to get his, sh- his sword up, and Dalinar battered it away, then dropped his own shield completely and came in with a two-handed power swing, intending to knock the light-eyed soldier back down. Fortunately, the man was good enough to recover his stance and intercept the blow with his shield. They probably heard the subsequent crack all the way back in Kolinar. Indeed, it vibrated up Dalinar's arms. Momentum. Life was about momentum. Pick a direction and don't let anything, man or storm, turn you aside. Dalinar battered at the Bright Lord, driving him backward. Until, surprisingly, the man pulled a feint and managed to get in close to Dalinar and ram him with his shield. Dalinar ducked the blow that followed, but the backhand hit him solidly on the side of the head, sending him stumbling. His helm twisted, metal bent by the blow, biting into his scalp, drawing blood. He saw double, his vision swimming. He roared as the Bright Lord smartly came in for the kill. Dalinar swung his blade up in a lurching, full-shouldered blow, slapping the Lord's own sword out of his hands and tossing both weapons aside. The man, in turn, punched Dalinar in the face with a gauntlet. His nose crunched. Dalinar fell to his knees, vision blurry. His foe was breathing deeply, cursing between breaths, winded by the short, frantic contest. The Bright Lord fished at his belt for a knife. An emotion stirred inside of Dalinar, a fire that filled the pit within him. It washed through him and awakened him, bringing clarity. The sounds of his elites fighting the Lord's Honor Guard faded. Metal on metal became clinks, grunts became like a distant humming. Dalinar grinned, and then that grin became a toothy smile. His vision returned as the Bright Lord, who had just retrieved his knife, looked up and started, stumbling back. He seemed horrified. Dalinar roared, spitting blood and throwing himself at the enemy. The swing that came for him seemed pitiful, and Dalinar ducked it, pushing his shoulder against his foe and shoving him backward. Something thrummed inside of Dalinar, the pulse of the battle, the rhythm of killing and dying, the thrill. He knocked his opponent off balance, then reached for his sword. Dim, however, hollered his name and tossed him a poleaxe with hook on one side and broad, thin axe on the other. Dalinar seized it from the air and spun, ducking the Lord's swing. At the same time, he hooked the man around the ankle with the axe head and yanked. The Bright Lord fell in a clatter of steel. Before Dalinar could attack further, unfortunately, the Honor Guard became a bother. Two had managed to extricate themselves from Dalinar's men, and they came to the defense of their Bright Lord. Dalinar caught their sword strikes on his polearm and twisted it about, backing away and bringing the axe head slamming into one man's side. He ripped it free and spun again, this time smashing the weapon down against the rising lord's head and sending him to his knees. Dalinar spun back and barely managed to catch the other guard's sword on the haft of the polearm. Dalinar pushed upward, holding the polearm in two hands, sweeping the guard's blade into the air over his head and stepping forward until he was face to face with the fellow. Then he spit blood from his shattered nose in the guard's face and kicked him in the stomach. He turned toward the Lord, who had scrambled again to his feet and was now trying to flee. Downar growled and swung the polearm by one hand, hooking the spike into the Lord's side and yanking, dropping him yet a third time. The Lord rolled. He was greeted by the side of Downar, slamming his polearm down by two hands, driving the spike right into the breastplate and into the chest. It made a satisfying crunch, and Downar pulled it out bloodied. The blow seemed a signal of sorts, and the honor guard and the other soldiers finally broke before his elites. Dalinar grinned as he watched them go, glory spren popping up around him like glowing golden spheres. His men took out their short short bows and dropped a good dozen of the fleeing enemy in the backs. Damnation, it felt good to best a foe force larger than his own. The thrill, unfortunately, dwindled. 
He could never seem to hold on to it as long as he wanted. Nearby, the man he'd felled groaned softly. Dalinar stepped over, curious, kicking at the armored chest. Why? the man said from within his helm. Why us? Don't know, Dalinar said, tossing the polearm back to Dim. You, you don't know? My brother chooses. I just go where he points me. He gestured toward the dying man, and Dim rammed a sword into the hole in the breastplate, finishing the job. The fellow had fought reasonably well, no need to extend his suffering. Another soldier approached, handing Dalinar his sword. It had a chip in it the size of a thumb right in the blade. It looked like it had bent as well. You're supposed to stick it in the squishy parts, Bright Lord, Dim said. Not pound it against the hard parts. I'll keep that in mind, Dalinar said, tossing the sword aside as one of his men selected a replacement from among those fallen of high enough rank. You all right, Bright Lord? Dim asked. Never been better, Dalinar said, then sucked blood up through his broken nose, hurt like damnation itself. His men formed up around him, and Dalinar led the way further down the street. Before too long, he could make out the bulk of the enemy still fighting ahead, harried by his main army. He halted his elites, contemplative. Orders, sir, Thaka, captain of the elites, asked. Raid those buildings, Dalinar said, pointing at a line of homes. Let's see how well they fight while they see us rounding up their families. Thaka nodded, shouting the orders. Dalinar reached for some water. He'd need to meet up with Sadius and... Something slammed into Dalinar's shoulder. He caught only a brief sight of it, a black blur that hit with the force of a roundhouse kick. It threw him down and pain flared up from his side. An arrow, he said, blinking as he found himself lying on the ground. A storming arrow sprouted from his right shoulder, one with a long, thick hat shaft. It had gone right through the, the plate. My, my lord, Thaka said, kneeling, shielding Dalinar with his body. Clack, Bright Lord, are you... Who in damnation shot that? Dalinar demanded. Up there, Dim said, pointing at the ridge above town. That's got to be 300 yards, Dalinar said, shoving Thaka aside and standing. That can't... He was watching, so he was able to jump out of the way of the next arrow, which dropped a mere foot from him, slamming against the stone ground. Dalinar stared at it, then started shouting, Horses! Where are the storming horses? They stood with the rear guard of the elites, fortunately, and came, the men came trotting forward, bringing the horses as his order was passed. Dalinar had to dodge another arrow as he seized the reins of full knight, his black gelding, and heaved himself into the saddle. He galloped back the way he'd come, trailed by ten of his best men. There had to be a way up that slope. There, a rocky set of switchbacks, shallow enough he didn't mind charging full knight right up them. He was more worried that by the time he reached the top, his quarry would have escaped. He eventually burst onto the top of the ridge, and another arrow slammed into his left bre breast, going right through the breastplate and nearly throwing him from the saddle. Damnation. He hung on somehow, clenching the reins in one hand and leaning low, watching ahead as the archer, still a distant figure, stood upon a rocky knob and launched another arrow, and another. Storms, the fellow was quick. Down our jerked full knight to one side, then the other, feeling the thrumming sense of the thrill return. It pushed away the pain, and his hooves made a clatter on stone as another arrow zipped past his face, dangerously close. Ahead, the archer finally seemed to grow alarmed and leapt from his perch to flee. Dalinar charged full knight over that lip a moment later, following after the fleeing archer, who turned out to be a man in his 20s wearing rugged, rugged clothing. Dalinar had the option to run him down, but instead galloped full knight right past and kicked the archer in the back, sending him sprawling. Dalinar pulled up his horse, then turned it about to pass by the groaning archer, who lay in a heap amid spilled black arrows. Dalinar's men caught up as he climbed roughly from the saddle, an arrow sprouting from each shoulder. He seized the archer who had finally struggled to his feet and was moving, dazed, for his belt knife. Dalinar turned the fellow about, noting the blue tattoo on his cheek. The archer gasped, staring at Dalinar, covered in soot from the fires, his face a mask of blood from the nose, stuck with not one, but two arrows. You waited until my helm was off, Dalinar demanded. You are an assassin. You were sent here specifically to watch for me. The man winced as Dalinar gripped him hard, but then the man nodded. Amazing, Dalinar said, letting go of the fellow. Show me that shot again. How far is that, Thaka? I'm right, aren't I? Over 300 yards? Almost four, Thaka said, but with a height advantage. Still, Dalinar said, stepping up to the lid, lip of the ridge. He looked back at the befuddled archer. Well, go grab your bow. My bow, 
the archer said. Are you deaf, man? Go get it. The archer regarded the ten armed soldiers on horseback, grim-faced and dangerous, before wisely deciding to obey. He picked up his bow and a few arrows, then stepped hesitantly over to Dalinar, giving one glance to the similar shafts that were still sticking out of him. Went right through my storming armor, Dalinar muttered, shading his eyes. To his right, down below, the armies clashed, and his main body of elites had come up to press the flank. The rear guard had found some civilians and was shoving them out into the street. Pick a corpse, Dalinar said, pointing toward an empty square where the, a skirmish had happened. Stick an arrow in one of those if you can. The archer licked his lips, still seeming confused. Finally, he took a spyglass off his belt and studied the area. The one in blue, he said, near that overturned cart. Dalinar squinted, then nodded. Nearby, Thaka had climbed off his horse and had slid out his sword, resting it on his shoulder. A not-so-subtle warning. The archer contemplated this, then drew his bow and launched a single black-fletched arrow. It soared true, sticking into the chosen corpse. Stormfather, Dalinar said, lowering his hand. Thaka, before today, I'd have bet you half the princedom that such a shot was impossible. He turned to the archer. What's your name, assassin? The man raised his chin, but didn't reply. Well, either way, welcome to my elites, <laughs> Dalinar said, brushing off his hands. Someone get this fellow a horse. What? The archer said. I tried to kill you. Yes, from a distance, which shows remarkably good judgment. <laughs> I have use for someone of your skills. We're enemies. Dalinar nodded toward the town below where the beleaguered army was at long last surrendering. Not anymore. Looks like we're all allies now. And there we go. <laughs> Well, thanks everybody for coming. Thanks to the Apple Store and thank you, Brandon. It was my pleasure. <laughs>